Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Cabina. I'm the Education Coordinator for GBRI, or the Green Building Research Institute, and I'll be the moderator for today's course. Today we'll be presenting Green Schools Part 1, Design Elements. This is the first part of our two-part series on Green Schools. The course description for today's webinar, Green Schools Part 1, Design Elements, is as follows. First, we'll go over school design. Then, beneficial green school strategies. Next, will be beneficial green school features. Ease of implementation. Significance of green schools. Lead criteria and case studies. Here you see some of our team members and contributors to our webinars. You'll also see Craig Schiller as well. He will be the instructor for today's course. Without any further ado, Here's Craig. So what makes school unique? I want to start here to orient us to what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. There are, in fact, several aspects that are unique to schools. First, schools have a very high occupancy rate. So you have all the students during the day, all in one place, um, high activity, high occupancy. Second, children are particularly vulnerable to toxins and other health hazards. Part of that is their metabolism. You know, they breathe three times, two to three times faster than a normal adult. They absorb many more toxins, both airborne and otherwise. Um, finally, you know, in my opinion, the most unique aspect of a school is that we learn in schools. That's the purpose and the function of a school. And over the lifetime of an actual student, by the time they graduate high school, they will have spent 14,000 hours in a school building. There isn't another building type where people uniformly spend that amount of time. Another unique aspect of schools is that the productivity of the occupants can be measured through standardized tests. Also, the Collaborative for High Performance Schools defines a high performance school in the following ways. Uh, that it's healthy, comfortable, efficient, easy to maintain and operate, environmentally responsive, commissioned, a teaching tool, safe and secure, a community resource, and stimulating architecture. For that reason, I'm assuming that uh, the people taking this course have a basic understanding of the LEED rating system. Uh, it is the intention of this course not to go into detail of all the credits required by LEED for Schools, mostly because LEED for Schools is extremely similar to uh, LEED for New Construction. Um, therefore, I'm going to highlight some of the credits unique to LEED for Schools compared to LEED NC. Finally, let's take a look at the last two categories, Innovation and in Design and Regional Priority. Not much has changed here. Credit one in ID, Innovation Design, is now worth a maximum of four points instead of five, and they actually added a credit, uh, the school's a teaching tool. If you remember, this is its own category, not just credit, its own category in the CHPS design guidebook, but it's just one, worth one point in lead. Um, regional priority credits are exactly the same. So again, to summarize, one credit with a different point and one new credit in the ID and regional priority categories. So that pretty much summarizes the Lead for Schools guidebook. Um, as you can tell, there is really not much difference between Lead for Schools and the Lead New Construction guidebook. So I highlighted some of the, the differences. I also, also want to highlight that Lead for Schools is a 100-point system, just like Lead NC, with 10 bonus points. Um, the same criteria for Lead Gold Silver, 40, 40 to 49 certified, 50 to 59 uh, silver, 60 to 79 is gold and 80 and above is platinum. So that concludes our section on LEED and the specifics of the LEED for School rating system. Now I'm going to focus on some of the design elements and design strategies that make up a green school. A lot of these strategies are going to match the new credits in the LEED system that we just went over, but most of them are really important to green schools regardless of any rating system. The first and the foremost important design element is daylighting. Second is indoor air quality. Third, acoustics. And for the fourth design element we're going to talk about is master planning and multipurpose. So the next indoor air quality topic is we're going to talk about is mold. Um, mold is so important as we talk about with that with the health and the asthma, etc., that it is its own credit in lead. IEQ credit 10 is mold prevention. Now, as its own credit, um, it does have a, a little weird niche. It actually requires you to hit the following credits. Uh, 3.1, which is construction indoor air quality management plan during construction. Uh, IEQ credit 7.1 and 7.2, which is thermal comfort compliance and verification, essentially ensuring that the temperature in the community is appropriate in the school to prevent mold growth. Part Sustainable Site Credit 10 is the Joint Use Facility Credit. 
that is a little more unique. As I mentioned, schools are a community funded community service. This joint use facilities credit wants to combine more community services in the same place. For example, in this credit, uh, schools are, uh, this credit requires schools to have at least three of the following services shared by the general public in the school um, site. That's either an auditorium, a gymnasium, cafeteria, or another classroom, playing fields, or joint parking. So again, we're taking community services and applying them to a community service, the school. The other option, so there's two options, the other option for this credit is to provide dedicated space for two of the following within the school site. And again, this is not, they're not limited to these options. So having a commercial office, a health clinic, a community service center, police office, police office, library or media center, parking lot, or a commercial sector businesses on the school site, create a joint use facility. Um, two other examples, this image is one that I took in Pittsburgh for a school that has a designated farmer's market space. So on their lawn, they actually put porous pavers under the grass so that farmers could come and park and have their farmer's market on the school site. So that the final one, and the one the, this is the last slide I have for you. Um, this is the school with the water, the water um, cistern with the waterfall, the Charles School in California. I'm, I'm putting this on here because this is also part of the research. The, the post-occupancy evaluation and occupancy evaluations these tell you how the students and the occupants and the teachers are doing, not just how the building and the system is doing, but how its occupants are doing. Throughout this presentation, I've talked about increased performance and increased health. Well, where does that stuff come from? That comes from research. That comes from a school being used as a teaching tool. The, 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 the part of that that is really important is that we can now quantify the benefits of these green schools. So if you look at this chart, the average satisfaction for this school is significantly, significantly higher than the average um, from an average of 158 buildings. Um, what that means is that this th this means that we can start quantifying the data for green schools. I'm showing this as the last slide because this is a teaser for the next half of the course. We're going to talk about the benefits of green schools, and it's because of this research. Um, yeah, so I think I think I'll end it there.